I wonder if you've ever been in trouble. You know, like really deep trouble. The kind where you didn't know where to turn. Maybe you were a kid and you needed help, but you knew if you went to your parent, then you would get into even bigger trouble. Do you anybody have a moment like yes? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it happened to you as an adult. Whether it was your fault or someone else's, the trouble just seems to pile up around you. And you're not sure you can get out of it. I think the stress of a situation like that can sometimes keep us from thinking clearly, too. So we know that we're in deep trouble, and a wiser self would probably know what to do, where to go for help, but because we're in the middle of the situation, we lose track of where true help comes from. We don't always make the wisest choices about who to go to or who to listen to, and when that happens, then our trouble gets even deeper, doesn't it? Well, that's kind of what happened to King Saul. The last time we read about Saul was a couple of chapters ago. David had snuck into his camp and stolen his water and his spear. And stealing a spear was kind of symbolic of Saul losing his power, which is what he was on the way to doing, this once great warrior. And when David confronted Saul, you may remember that Saul felt really ashamed of what he had been doing to David. <clears throat> and he promised David that he wouldn't chase him anymore. And so he said, David, you can come on home. I'm not going to chase you anymore. But we all know that Saul was not very believable, right? Because he'd said that before, and then he kept chasing him. And so David ended up going into Philistine territory, crossing enemy lines, rather than facing Saul again. And then you may remember that at the very beginning of chapter 28, we read that the Philistines had mustered their armies for another war on Israel, which kind of put David in an awkward position because there he is with the Philistines. Now, the Philistines had a much larger army. They were much better equipped than the army of Israel. They likely had stronger leaders than Saul, who had been wasting his time chasing David. And so this was indeed a pretty frightening situation. Israel was in trouble. Saul was in trouble, and he knew it. Deep, deep trouble. And so today, as we look at chapter 28 of 1 Samuel, I invite you to read along. And we're going to see how Saul responds to the deep trouble that he's in. We're going to start with verse 3, and it gives us like a little background information to kind of just as a reminder. Verse 3 of chapter 28 says, Meanwhile, Samuel had died, and all of Israel had mourned for him. He was buried in Ramah, his hometown. Now, you remember that Samuel is the prophet who had anointed Saul and also David. And so he was the spiritual leader for Israel and for these kings. And it also says that Saul had banned from the land of Israel all mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. So that's just a little spoiler alert of where we're going. Verse 4 says, The Philistines set up their camp at Shunem, and Saul gathered all the army of Israel and camped at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the vast Philistine army, he became frantic with fear. You see, he knows he's in trouble. He's outnumbered. What are they going to do? And this Saul reminds me of the Saul that was first anointed. Do you remember when Samuel was looking for him and he was hiding behind the luggage? And you get this image of Saul just shaking in fear, knowing that he doesn't have what it takes. And so Saul is frantic, but then his trouble goes from deep to deeper when he looks for help. Verse 6 says, he asked the Lord what he should do, but the Lord refused to answer him, either by dreams or by sacred lots or by the prophets. Now, are we surprised that the Lord is not answering Saul? Because, first of all, the Lord's been talking to Saul, and he disobeyed him, right? We also know that, that the prophet Samuel is the one that he would have turned to most easily, but Samuel has passed on. And then the, sa the sacred lots would have been cast by the priests using the, the, the human and the, the thuman and the urim. You remember that? But what happened to the priests? 
Well, all the priests at Nod, he had wiped out when he thought they were helping David, right? And the one priest that got away had the Urim and the Thummim, and he is with David now. So Saul has really put himself in this situation where there is no good place to turn for help, and God is being silent. And so by not hearing him, he looks to another source. And verse 7 says, Saul then said to his advisors, find a woman who is a medium so I can go and ask her what to do. Bum, bum, bum. A medium is someone who speaks to people who have already died. And some translations, depending on what Bible you're looking at, call her actually the witch, the witch of Endor. But whatever you call the woman that he's going to seek out, what you should know is that she does have power. But her power is not of God. And so this practice of talking to the dead is something that God has strictly forbidden. If you go back and you look at God's word, especially in Leviticus, you'll find in 1931, he said, Do not defile yourselves by turning to mediums or to those who consult the spirits of the dead. I am the Lord your God. In Leviticus 20, verse 6, he said, I will also turn against those who commit spiritual prostitution by putting their trust in mediums or in those who consult the spirits of the dead. I will cut them off from the community. Leviticus 20, 27 says, Men and women among you who act as mediums or who consult the spirits of the dead must be put to death by stoning. They are guilty of a capital offense. And then in Deuteronomy 18, 11, it says, for example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering and do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because other nations have done these detestable things that you're, the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. So is there any room for negotiation on how God feels about people who practice these kind of occult practices? Any doubt? And Saul clearly knew this because he actually had made it a, a illegal in the land of Israel and had told everyone who was a medium or a psychic that they had to leave. Isn't it ironic then that in the face of that knowledge, when he didn't know what to do and when he was in deep trouble, he sends his men to find a medium. And they found one. His advisors reply, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself by wearing ordinary clothing instead of his royal robes. And then he went to the woman's home at night, accompanied by two of his men. I have to talk to a man who has died, he said. Will you call up his spirit for me? Are you trying to get me killed, the woman demanded. You know that Saul has outlawed all the mediums and all who consult the spirits of the dead. Why are you setting a trap for me? But Saul took an oath in the name of the Lord and promised, as surely as the Lord lives, nothing bad will happen to you for doing this. Do you see what's going on here? He goes into darkness, in the dark of the night. He disguises himself, and this woman has no idea that she's talking to Saul. And in fact, she's afraid of getting punished. Are you trying to trick me into violating the law? And isn't it weird then that Saul makes a vow to God. He calls upon the name of God to tell her she will not be hurt for violating God's law. I don't think that was God's will, do you? How funny that now he's going to make a vow in God's name. Finally, the woman said, well, whose spirit do you want me to call up? Call up Samuel, Saul replied. When the woman saw Samuel, she screamed, You've deceived me. You are Saul. Don't be afraid, the king told her. What do you see? I see a God coming up out of the earth, she said. 
What does he look like? Saul asked. He is an old man wrapped in a robe, she replied. And Saul realized it was Samuel, and he fell to the ground before him. The woman in Endor was shocked when Samuel appeared. And it was in that moment then that she also had the awareness of who Saul was. And so her eyes were opened to what was really going on. Now she stands before the very one who would have had her killed for her practices. She doesn't seem to know who Samuel is. She says he looks like a god or that's also translated spirit or a ghost. He looks like a spirit coming up out of the ground. But instantly Saul knows that it is indeed Samuel. Samuel, the, once, the one who had once been a great advisor for him, but also the one that he had failed to listen to, whose advice he didn't take. And Samuel's attitude towards Saul has not really changed, apparently, in the afterlife. Why have you disturbed me by calling me back, Samuel asked Saul. Because I am in deep trouble, Saul replied. The Philistines are at war with me, and God has left me and won't reply by prophets or dreams. And so I have called for you to tell me what to do. Oh, now you want to ask for my help, huh? But Samuel replied, why ask me? Since the Lord has left you and has become your enemy. The Lord has done just as he said he would. He has torn the kingdom from you and given it to your rival, David. And the Lord has done this to you today because you refuse to carry out his fierce anger against the Amalekites. And what's more, the Lord will hand you and the army of Israel over to the Philistines tomorrow, and you and your sons will be here with me. The Lord will bring down the entire army of Israel in defeat. This is not good news, is it? And some of it's the same things that that Saul's been told before. But I wonder if it's not even worse because of his consultation with the median, because he adds this, and um, because today the Lord is going to hand you over to the army of Israel, or to the army of the Philistines. Saul fell full length on the ground, paralyzed with fright because of Samuel's words, And he was also faint with hunger, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. And when the woman saw how distraught he was, she said, Sir, I obeyed your command at the risk of my life. Now you do what I say, and let me give you a little something to eat so that you can regain your strength for the trip back. But Saul refused to eat anything. And then his advisors joined the woman in urging him to eat, so he finally yielded and got up from the ground and sat on the couch. And the woman had been fattening a calf, so she hurried out and killed it. She took some flour, kneaded it into dough, and baked unleavened bread. And she brought the meal to Saul and his advisors, and they ate it. And then they went out into the night. And so Saul is served this kind of last supper, complete with unleavened bread served to him by this woman of darkness who at this point is the only one who seems to have compassion on him. I wonder what you think about this account from the life of Saul. Do you believe it? Do you believe that the witch of Endor had power? Do you believe that Samuel came back from the dead? To talk to Saul. I've seen a lot of accounts that try to discount this story. Like that maybe it just seemed like these things happened. Or like the witch of Endor had tricked him. But I have to tell you church that I believe it. I believe that there is a power at work that did not come from God. And I believe that he wants to warn us against accessing that power he didn't have to allow it to become a part of his word but he did and how easy is it for us to skip over it and take it lightly like it's just pretend or like it's superstition 
But as you've already seen, there are several references in the Bible to the dangers of sorcery, witchcraft, and communicating with the dead. And those are not the only ones. You may remember, too, that Pharaoh had magicians that would cast spells so that even when the plagues were coming, his magicians early on came and counteracted those plagues. You may remember Simon the sorcerer who amazed people in Samaria, and we learned about him in the book of Acts. And he actually tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit because he wanted to add that power to his arsenal. And what all of that tells me is that there are indeed powers of the dark side. And that these powers are not ones that God wants us to seek out, even when we are in deep trouble. They are evil and they are dangerous. And it reminds me of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there in the garden with Adam and Eve. And God said, stay away from it. Don't eat of that fruit. But the enemy came to them and said, oh, but if you eat it, you will be like God. You see, you will have power. That was the appeal of the forbidden fruit. But that was a lie, wasn't it? It was a lie that led to death. And as sure as there was something in that tree that God didn't intend for man to have, there are powers out there that he does not intend for us to access. It can be so easy for us to make light of them. To believe that they're harmless or lighthearted fun. But I think that's how the enemy draws us in. I think the enemy likes to convince us that it's okay to dabble with a little bit of darkness. As long as we don't take it too seriously. I believe that the enemy wants to convince us that it's okay to watch it if it's a cute movie. Or it's okay to dress up in it if it's a fun costume and you get candy in exchange. But I don't think for a second that's how God looks at it. Because I think indeed when we dabble with darkness, we are like children playing with a danger we don't know exists. And God sees it from a different perspective with all the evil that threatens to come about because of it. Saul knew better. Didn't he? Saul knew better. But he was in deep trouble. And he wanted some kind of power to guide him. And in that moment, he didn't care where the power or the insight came from. He disguised himself and violated his own laws and went where he should not have gone because he wanted knowledge that he didn't have. And it turned out to be knowledge that didn't even help him right? It didn't change a thing. And I think it's easy for us to condemn Saul for that, especially because we know that Saul had experienced the power of God. You remember when he was first anointed and he started prophesying with the prophets? The Holy Spirit was in him. He had been the recipient of God's anointing. He went to battle and came out victorious when he was outnumbered. Why? Because God went with him, right? Saul knew the power of God. But when he got into deep trouble and he couldn't hear God's voice, then he looked for a cheap alternative. But maybe it's not just Saul who does that. Maybe we're inclined to do that too. Maybe when we feel like we're in trouble, we don't know where to turn. Maybe we are easily lured into something that looks like it will give us some power because that's preferable to relying on the power of God. But it's a lie. Some people look to mystics and palm readers or astrology for answers about the future. Others turn to drugs and alcohol or food or sex or pornography for comfort. Some feel powerless 
in their situations. And so they look to gain power that isn't there either through crystals or spells or money and influence. Other peoples are searching for peace and they resort to incantations, meditation, or yoga. How sad is it that when we're looking for all these things, our flesh seeks out the things that are cheap alternatives. Instead of looking to the one who holds the true answers and the ultimate power. This is what Isaiah warned about in Isaiah 8, 19. It says, someone may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. With their whisperings and mutterings, they will tell us what to do. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Should the living seek guidance from the dead? It's ridiculous, isn't it? And so, my friends, if you find yourself in deep trouble, here's what I want to say to you. Call on Jesus. Don't turn to darkness for answers and power that you don't need. But hold on to the one who has the truth and who has the answer and who has his Holy Spirit who wants to help you and guide you throughout your life. Isn't that so much better? And part of the reason that, that God wasn't responding to Saul is because of his disobedience. And that's heartbreaking, isn't it? But you know what happens to us when we're disobedient? We have the opportunity to call on Jesus anyway and to ask for his forgiveness so that we might be restored in our relationship with a God who wants to guide us and wants to give us answers and wants to share his power with us. I wonder what would have happened if Saul had been truly repentant. He acted repentant with David, but we knew he would chase him again, right? What if Saul had fallen on his face before he saw Samuel and said, My father, I have sinned. Please forgive me. And maybe that was a foreign thing to him at that point, but it's not to us, is it? Because we can call on Jesus. And he will send his spirit to help us. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. And he will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. Isn't that the kind of power you want? The spirit of truth who guides you into all truth. Who tells you about the future and who brings God glory. Jesus also told his followers, you will receive power when the Spirit comes. Do you believe that? If you're in the midst of trouble, my friends, do you know that you have access to a power that is greater than any power the world has ever known? That the God who spoke our world into existence wants to be on your side and help you in the midst of your trouble? Do you know that? There is no greater power than that. Satan can have all of his armies fighting against us. And, and there are demons and people with powers that we don't understand. But at the end of the day, none of it compares to the power of God. Why on earth would you want to look to the loser for power? Because in the end, we know that God's power will re reign victorious over everything. There are dark days around us, and there are a lot of people who are turning to the dark side for power. I've seen the videos of people getting debaptized and pledging their allegiance to Satan. This is the spirit that's permeating our culture these days. I have friends whose children grew up in the church and were taught to love the Lord and they walked away from it because they're serving Satan instead. 
wearing buttons that say, Hail Satan. Do you see? This is all around us. It is not distant. It is not hundreds of years ago. It is now, and we are at war. And this is not a war of flesh and blood, but it is a war of principalities and spirits. Do you see? There is a power on the other side, but you must make a choice. And please be aware that that power leads to death and destruction every time. And I'm sure that there are some who feel like that kind of power is appealing. But they are deceived. Because those spirits are disguised and come in the dark of night. But they cannot stand up to the God of light. If you want wisdom, truth, power, and insight, God is here, ready to give it to you. All you have to do is ask. He tells us in his word, if you want wisdom, ask for it. If you want to know the truth, the spirit of truth will show you. If you want the guidance, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. Do you see? He is here. His power is here We don't have to be on the losing side because our Savior has already won. In Revelation, it lists those who practice sorcery among the others who will not set foot in the kingdom of God. How sad it would be to take hold of some power now in exchange for eternity in heaven with our Creator. If you're in trouble this morning, there's hope. If you're in deep trouble, there's help. Call on Jesus, my friends. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you don't want us to be ignorant to the powers around us. We thank you that you call us to a higher level of holiness. We thank you that you want to give us your power, that you don't want us to live in defeat, but that you want victory to be shown through us. And Father God, I pray that that everyone listening to this message, whether here or online, would receive this message that the power in darkness is deceptive and destructive, but the power from God is beautiful It is light, and it is hope. May we take hold of your power. May we never live like children who are defeated. May we look at the enemy's armies, and even in those moments when we think, oh my, we're outnumbered, may we call upon the name of Jesus and realize that numbers don't matter to you because you are more powerful than all of it. Help us not to compromise, Lord. Help us not to dabble in darkness, but to take a stand for the light. We're your children, and we give ourselves to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.